This is the third lecture for MA 1012. In this lecture, we'll think about complex functions of a complex variable. A complex function of a complex variable should have some complex number output and some complex number input. We might not allow, allow all complex numbers as input, but some collection of complex numbers from some subset of the complex plane go in the z's, and then some numbers come out of these w's. So we could come up with simple examples that might be important for us, things like uh, polynomial functions, uh, 7 plus 2i times z squared plus uh, 49i z cubed plus 2 plus i is a polynomial because it has constant coefficients times powers of z's. Um, we could have other examples that would be complex functions of a complex variable. Say g of z is the, uh, the conjugate of z minus the magnitude of z squared, and similar sorts of things like this. Um, we could allow h of z is um, z squared plus i over z squared minus i, for example, as a function which is maybe not defined everywhere. It's not defined where this thing vanishes. So they're defined for some complex numbers, maybe not for all of them. The first and most important observation we can make at this point about these functions is that there's no uh, way to draw the graph. When we have a real function of a real variable, we draw some kind of graph. But that would be if we had some y equals f of x real function of a real variable, which is what we're used to. For a complex function of a complex variable, we have two uh, uh, numbers being input, the real dimensioning parts of z are the inputs, and you have two outputs. So if you have two inputs and two outputs, then you can't really draw the graph in the usual sense because the graph would have to be in four dimensions, the two inputs coming in, and then somehow in some other dimensions the outputs coming out. So we can't really draw the graph in the usual way. We can talk about such functions being continuous, um, simply in the sense that uh, if we take a limit as z approaches some z naught of f of z um, being f of z naught, that's what we call continuous. Um, but we have to remember that a limit is taken in a different sense in the complex numbers because the limit could be as the z goes in toward the z naught uh, this way or this way or this way or this way or in some funny spiraling way. Um, it, uh, it has the freedom to move in towards it, not any way what we like. So we have to be a bit more careful about continuity. It's a bit more subtle. It's, it's not hugely difficult. We won't go through the effort of doing it to show that, in fact, um, uh, polynomials are continuous. Uh, are continuous. Also, that um, as z goes to z bar, the map, the conjugation mapping is continuous. Um, and that uh, various other natural things like z goes to the real part of z. If you may only move z a little bit, you only move its real part a little bit. And, the, uh, and z goes to imaginary part of z are also continuous. Those are all continuous um, func functions of a complex variable. Similarly, um, uh, the... Um, uh, functions like uh, f of z is say, z over z plus 2 uh, is certainly continuous except away from except away from z equal to 2, so, or z equal to minus 2. When z is not minus 2, then this is perfectly nice and continuous, and so on for similar sorts of, of functions. If we take any arithmetic operations on continuous functions, we always get continuous functions. So, for example, if we had a, um, if we had a continuous function, we could add... Um, uh, continuous functions to get another one, multiply them uh, to get another one, take the ratio to get another one, uh, wherever this one's not zero, and so on and so forth. All those standard operations will take continuous functions to continuous functions. We'd like to have all of our old friend functions back again uh, that we had from real variable theory. So we know that with real variables we could do things like uh, we had our sine uh, function and a cosine function. Remember, those are always thought of as radians. Um, we had an exponential function, e to the x, or uh, also it is an exponential of x. And we had other sorts of functions like this. Uh, the trick we're going to use to try and extend them to complex variables to allow complex inputs 
is a bit sneaky because at first we think, when we think about the sine or cosine, we always think of that as an angle in radians. And what does it mean for a complex number to be a measurement of the angle between two curves, uh, say in the plane or in space? How would that work? But instead what we can do is simply to plug in formally, pretend that it makes sense as we've done before with our other arithmetic operations we found with our arithmetic operations we found if we formally just pretended that we knew how to do manipulate such things what we do is simply put that in and then apply trig um, identity we apply the obvious trig identity for um, for sums the sign of a sum and um, that gets us at least part way uh, toward getting a sine function defined if we keep going and working a little bit harder, we can actually get out some kind of formal expression for a sine and a cosine and an exponential. Um, we won't go through all the effort. Let's just write down the final answers that you'd get if you went through this kind of step. First, you'd have to do that. Then you have to figure out what is sine of iy and cosine of iy. Um, that would require you to do a bit more work, which we won't do. Um, we'll simply write down the answers. Um, the exponential of a complex number, again, where z is x plus i y is simply defined to be the exponential of the real part times the cosine of the imaginary part plus i times the sine of the imaginary part. Note that all the functions here are functions of real variables. You have a real x, so you can take its real, ordinary real variable exponential. A real uh, number y, so its cosine is ordinary cosine of a real number, and a real number y, so its sine is the sine of a real number. So we've expressed the exponential of a, of a complex number in terms of its real imaginary parts and, and usually usual real variable functions. Now, I haven't really justified why that should be the right answer, but I've said that it's possible to convince yourself that this is the right answer with some work. Um, so um, we can also define the sine of a complex number to be uh, the sine of its real part times the hyperbolic cosine of its imaginary part plus i times the cosine of its real part and the hyperbolic sine of its imaginary part and the cosine uh, by a similar uh, story, cos x, co hyperbolic cosine y, minus i, sine x, hyperbolic sine y. Um, now, if you're not familiar with the hyperbolic sine and cosine, your calculator probably is. Uh, they're functions that arise naturally in studying, replacing the role of the circle in the study of the cosine and sine by the hyperbola. Um, but we won't go through that in detail. We'll just say that in, in principle you can compute out these things this way, and it is uh, already known on your calculator what these weird functions are, these uh, these special functions. One other way to, to, to convince yourself these are the right definitions for these functions is to think about it in terms of uh, uh, trig identities and, and, and exponential identities. We certainly want the identity that... Um, we want more or less all the identities to still hold. Everything we know about these functions should still hold. And the basic identity about the exponential is this one. So we want an exponential function that should agree with the usual exponential when z is real, and which should satisfy this. And that's a long way toward getting us here. It's not quite all the way. But, um, but that will indeed work, so I'm not going to prove it. But if you plug z plus w in, z is x plus i, y w, u plus iv. So you plug in some z's and w's into this formula here and expand everything out. You use trig identities. You will get this. So that's a very nice uh, nice result. I mean, it does, it does, after all, extend the usual identity in the real case. All the identities from the real case will come out as identities here. So in particular, you'll have the uh, real um, variable identity. We're familiar with the sign, some of the sign of a sum of angles. Um, comes out with exactly the same formula, but now the numbers involved aren't real numbers, they're just co they're complex numbers, Z and W. And similar to the cosine of Z plus W equals cos Z cos W minus sine Z sine W. So those are the usual uh, rules for adding angles, how sines and cosines work when you add angles, except that in this situation we're allowing the numbers not to be real anymore. The Z and W can both be complex numbers and the identities still hold. And again, as I said before, all identities really that we are used to working with uh, in, in trigonometry or in the study of exponential functions, they all still hold. So if we look at um, uh, how this relates to our theory about uh, the 
argument and the modulus of the complex number, um, we know that if we have a complex number z is x plus i y, we said that its uh, modulus was this guy, its length as a vector in the plane, and then its argument was uh, uh, was uh, the angle uh, of that point of that point x y from the origin. Um, uh, measured this way, but uh, we're allowing our angles to go um, between uh, minus pi and pi, so we don't we don't go here. Um, so uh, so around this direction. Okay, so that's our, at least that's the principal argument angle. Um, now that gives us uh, the, as we said before that z therefore is if we met the this this guy be r, and this guy be theta, then we get z is r times cos theta plus i sine theta. So that's how we can represent every ang every complex number in polar coordinates. This polar coordinate description is that it has a real part uh, r cos theta, an imaginary part r sine theta, the usual trig formulas for for the x and y um, uh, x and y uh, locations of an x y point in the plane based on its its um, polar values r and theta. So this uh, fits neatly with our with our formula for exponentials e to the z is e to the x times cos y plus i sine y. You can see there's a certain similarity there, in that we're finding that um, therefore the modulus, the length, is e to the x. The length of the exponential is the exponential of the real part. It's a little bit surprising. So it's the exponential of the real part, and then the argument of e to the z, the angle, is exactly this guy, so it's just y. Um, so that's a rather nice result about complex exponentials, a little bit fancier than what we see in real variables, because neither of those make sense in the real variable setting. Um, the uh, real variable uh, identities that we're familiar with, again, keep working. So things like e to the minus z is 1 over e to the z, that would work for z if it was just a real number, that would be perfectly fine, and it still works for complex numbers. All of the all of the identities that you're familiar with, they still work. Um, also things like e to the 0 is 1 still works, because after all, 0 is a real number, and our, our exponential for complex numbers extends the usual exponential for real numbers, so it has the same values of the real variables, inputs. So um, since 0 is real, that works still fine. So let's do some examples where we calculate some things out, calculate out some ex uh, some explicit um, uh, exponentials and sines and cosines. Um, so if I want to work out an exponential e to the 2 plus 3i, um, then we know it has to be e to the 2, e to the 3i, because it's um, additive. Uh, it takes addition to multiplication, like usual exponential formula. Um, so that e to the 2, that's done, because that's how long it is. Um, but we know that, that this guy, e to the 3i, we can expand out. We did say that we had a, a formula that involved a cosine of the y part. That'd be the 3 here. Cos 3 plus i sine 3. And again, that's 3 in radians. Um, so you can write out its real part as e to the 2 cos 3 plus i times its measure part is e to the 2 sine 3. Okay, Again, it's cos 3 and sine 3 of radians, not of degrees. Okay, so, um, so it gives an example of explicitly computing out an exponential um, of, of, a, of a complex number. So let's do a somewhat more involved problem. Um, let's try to solve the equation sine z equals i cos z. What are all the z's that satisfy that equation? So we can explicitly write out the formula for sine z. It's uh, sine x times hyperbolic cosine y plus i cos x times hyperbolic sine y. And then we can do the same thing for the other side, i cos z. It's i times cos z, which was cos x cos y minus i sine x sinh y. Okay, so there we have it all written, and we can just um, multiply that by that, and that by that, expand that out. This guy times i times minus i is 1, so you get sine x 
cinch y and you get here plus uh, i times cos x cos y. Now for two complex numbers to be equal, their real parts have to be equal and their imaginary parts have to be equal. So the real part of the sine z, that is our sine z here, its real part is this guy. And then the i cos z, that's this here, and its real part is this guy. So those have to be equal. And similarly, the imaginary parts have to be equal. So that's the imaginary part for sine z. And on the other side, the imaginary part of i cos z is this one. And so those would have to be equal as well, giving us equations that look like this. Sine x cos y equals sine x sinh y. And simultaneously, cosine x sinh y equals cosine x cos y. Okay, so now we know that one of sine, so we have we know that sine squared x plus cos squared x is one is a trig identity, which you have to remember. Um, and that means one of these is non-zero. So either the sine's not zero or the cos isn't zero, one or the other. And so we can therefore either divide both sides by sine in this equation because the sine's not zero, or divide, divide both sides by cosine in this equation because it's not zero. And so one way or the other, we get the equation cos y equals sinh y from this one, or the opposite equation cos y equals sinh y from this one. So that must happen. Now, um, you, you probably don't remember cos and sinh, but their definitions actually are these. Uh, cos y is uh, the average of the exponential of y and exponential minus y. Um, and then sinh is given by difference of the exponentials, half the difference of the exponentials. So for these to be equal, um, how would that work? Uh, well, we could subtract that out from both sides, and we get that these are equal, but they're negatives of each other. So we're getting multiplied by 2 to get rid of that. We get e to the minus y equals minus e to the minus y. But e to the y is positive for any real number. Remember, y is the imaginary part, so it's a real number. And then this guy has to be negative because it's a positive number times a minus sign. And that's a contradiction. And therefore, there are no solutions. Because if there's any solution, it would have to somehow manage to satisfy that thing. Next time, we'll think about square roots, cube roots, and all that sort of stuff.